Now, in the past, I've interviewed a few guests about meditation, and it is a tool that you can use to explore the path to improve your consciousness level. But there are other tools that are better. And I used to use these types of tools that are conventionally viewed as meditation, but I've identified better strategies that I'm going to discuss and explore and with our guest, Corinne Winter, who has been doing this for a long time and actually teaching children how to do it. And the interesting irony is that children, yes, children are likely the best meditators on the planet. When I worked at Islip for about a decade and I saw that a lot of our students were really dysregulated. So they had an inability to manage their stress. They had a lot of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and it was, it was shocking and devastating. And we needed a solution. At the time, I owned a yoga studio as a side hustle because, you know, educators don't make a lot of money. <laughs> and um, I recruited about seven um, yoga teachers that were stay-at-home moms that had degrees in social work, psychology, and education. And they assisted me in building out this curriculum. And we all went in once a week for eight weeks to these 17 classrooms. And at the end, we had 500 students quietly meditating in a field. And it was unbelievable. It was the most moving day of my life. It was life-changing. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I think our children just in general need more joy. And also children have so many mirroring neurons. They have like around twice as many mirroring neurons that I have, right, and that you have. And so they learn from our behavior. So if a teacher is dysregulated, they're gonna pick up on that and they're gonna uh -huh. be dysregulated. The number one thing you can do to teach mindfulness to children is just to learn it yourself. Because they, they're picking up on their parents and, and their emotional state and their well-being. Welcome everyone, this is Dr. Mercola helping you take control of your health. And today we're gonna have a really fascinating discussion about meditation and consciousness. And the facilitator for that is a woman I met at the Documenting Hope Conference in Orlando a few weeks prior to this recording. And uh, I met her in the exhibit section and she had uh, shared her interest with me in meditation and what she was doing. And I thought it sounded intriguing because I was definitely had a pretty significant meditation practice and I thought I understood it. But since the time we met, <laughs> I've, I've actually done a lot of exploration. We'll talk about that in a moment, but um, I've changed my views on things quite a bit. That's what I'm always doing. I'm always in a process of revising what I understand to be true. So, but we're going to talk about the meditation first and then we'll get into that. So, uh, Corinne Winter is a pure soul who has, who strongly believes in the value of meditation to connect, to improve consciousness levels. And in an effort to ex expand that awareness to others, she's developed a organization that is committed to teaching children how to do this. And uh, I will let her take it from here so she can, so Corinne, why don't you tell us a little about, about your journey and how you got here and what your organization is all about. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mercola. It's my pleasure to be here. It's an honor, truly. Uh, I've admired you for a very long time and I love the work that you do in the world. You're one of my all-time heroes. So thank you for having me. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Corinne Winter, the founder of Mission B, and we're a nonprofit that brings mindfulness into schools and organizations, but primarily schools. Um, I founded the organization in 2013. And I was a social worker at the time in Islip High School. And I had been working with adolescents by then about 14 years. I started off as a social worker working in the foster care system um, with youth that were considered hard to place in group homes and residential treatment centers. I had done some clinical work under a psychologist and a clinical social worker. Um, and then I worked at Islip for about a decade and I saw that a lot of our students were really dysregulated. So they had an inability to manage their stress. Um, they had a lot of anxiety, depression, substance abuse. We had really an epidemic of heroin go through our school. Um, and it was, it was shocking and devastating. Um, and I, we needed a solution. And as a school social worker, 
I would see around 120 students a year, um, which there was 1,200 students in the building. So about 10% of them were getting social work counseling. And then the other 90% weren't really getting any mental health support unless they were getting it outside of the building. Um, also, we were implementing uh, curriculum through the health classes and our district did the best to bring in good curriculum. Um, but I just wasn't personally satisfied with it. I didn't think that we were teaching the children the skills to self-regulate. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I started a pilot um, in our high school and it was voluntary. And 56% of our students signed up voluntarily to participate in this program during, as an alternative to phys ed twice a week for eight weeks. And we collected some data at the end and it was phenomenal. The students loved the program. They had reductions in stress, reductions in anxiety, and they really enjoyed themselves. So um, after launching that pilot, I started working um, with the elementary schools in my district, although I was not assigned to them. And I asked my principal if I could leave every Friday from 12 to three and teach meditation. So one of my friends was a teacher over in the elementary school and she's like, my kids are so stressed. You have to come help me out. So I went over there for a few Fridays in a row, and within a month, I had 17 requests from elementary school teachers to go in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. So at the time, um, I owned a yoga studio as a side hustle, because, you know, educators don't make a lot of money. <laughs> and um, I recruited about seven um, yoga teachers that were stay-at-home moms that had degrees in social work, psychology, and education. And they assisted me in building out this curriculum. And we all went in once a week for eight weeks to these 17 classrooms. And at the end, we had um, 500 students quietly meditating in a field. And it was unbelievable. It was the most moving day of my life. It was life changing. And um, I knew that that's what I wanted to do um, rather than, than uh, stay as a school social worker. And Dr. Mercola, if it's okay with you, I could share a photograph from that day. Would you like to see? Sure. Yeah. Of that day, there's nothing that tells this story better than this picture. I feel like it's better than most data. Yes. So indeed. So, yeah. If you look here, you can see all of these children meditating and you can see their faces, their posture, like they are actually sitting and doing a mindfulness practice. Thank you for sharing that photo. Uh, I'm really curious as to the average age of the children you were teaching this because it's a big part of the discussion I want to have with you. That's a very large part of it actually, because it's, it's, it, I thought they were the, 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 the children, the age of the children in the photo you just shared was probably 10 in that range somewhere, give or take a year or two. Is that accurate? Yeah. Those children in that particular photo were around third through fifth grade. Um, okay. we, and how, what, the, what's, what's the age of that? Seven? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, around seven to, to 10. Um, okay, seven to eight. All right, so because there's a big difference between that and the adolescents that really I wouldn't classify as children at all that are really many adults who we yes. were addressing in high school. Different physiology, diff entirely different set of circumstances. Yeah, we have a, two separate curriculums: one for middle and high school, and then another one for elementary. And within each curriculum, it's tiered for academic learning. And yeah. okay. All right. So thank you for the clarification. I'll let you continue with your journey. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So we started this pilot and then um, actually Fox did a special on my nonprofit and it aired nationally. And we got calls from all over the country, from Wyoming to Kansas, but primarily we got a lot of calls locally. And so I was working full time at the school and I started implementing with my volunteers in different school districts and it became to be a lot of too much work. So I took a one year leave of absence from Islip. I moved out to Silicon Valley because apparently that's the place to start for startups. I actually moved into a startup house. It was supposed to be women, middle aged women working on humanitarian projects, but 90 percent of them dropped out. So they moved me two days before into a house with startup entrepreneurs uh, guys in their early 20s. So <laughs> I was turning 40 that year. So I was living in a unique environment. Um, we were living in the Castro uh, in San Francisco, which I absolutely loved. It was really fun. And I learned so much from these young men about how to build a business plan, how to create a mm -hmm. digital application, how to use Amazon Calculator. And so I spent the whole summer in basically a boot camp learning how to start a nonprofit. And it was spectacular. And so from there, um, we stayed in New York and I 
basically was bi-coastal for six years. Um, and we started implementing in some of the highest performing Silicon Valley schools and some of the lowest performing schools in the Bay Area as well. Um, but schools like Menlo Atherton, which we're still in, um, over at Sequoia Healthcare District, we serve um, a lot of schools within that district, as well as Mountain View and Los Altos, which is where like all of the big tech companies are located. And we're still in those schools today. Um, we've been with Mountain View and Los Altos for a while, um, and we do that through grant funding. Um, and then we, we still implement it in New York. So right now, like this day, on this day in particular, we're in 26 schools um, this semester um, in New York, and we're impacting 10 schools in California where we're providing direct services. So we're actually going into the schools once a week for a number of weeks. It varies between the district and their budget, um, and we're implementing a mindfulness curriculum. So. Um, do you have any questions or I could share with you um, what the curriculum includes if you're interested in that? Sure, that would be great. Okay, cool. So our, our content essentially um, is based on evidence-based uh, practices like breath, movement, um, visualizations, affirmations, sharing circles, and silent seated breath. And so when we go into a classroom, we're there for approximately 40 minutes. Um, we start the students, and this is, it changes based on their learning level and their grade level, um, but we have a bit of a rhythm to how we provide the program, and it's very interactive and it's very fun. Um, so we'll start with some movement, um, like some gentle stretching. We don't have to rearrange the room. We'll, the kids will stand right next to their chairs, um, and they'll do some gentle movements for maybe like four or five minutes. Then they'll sit back down. We'll do uh, about a four or five minute guided mindfulness practice. Now, if they're in kindergarten and they're restless, we might be doing two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, after that, everyone stands and we do a circle share. So we get around the circle and everyone shares how they're feeling or something they're grateful for or one thing they love about themselves. It depends on the topic. Then they sit back down um, and we introduce a topic. So let's say the topic is gratitude. We'll introduce the concept. We'll talk about some of the scientific benefits of being grateful. We'll, we'll share some data that's age appropriate. Um, and then we'll have them engage in an activity. So now they'll get into like a big circle and share something they're grateful for about their family or school or their general life. Um, that particular lesson that I'm using as an example also includes an art project. So the students will all, it's called the gratitude sun. So we make a giant sun and we take strips of paper and every child writes what they're grateful for and then we post it in the classroom. Um, so that's kind of the rhythm. And then it ends with a visualization. So the students will close their eyes and we'll take them to either a beach or a rainforest because children are imagination deprived these days, thanks to technology. And um, they'll sit and they'll do a visualization and we'll close with an affirmation. And depending on their great age, they'll either say what, you know, what they're grateful for out loud or they'll say yeah, their affirmation out loud. And then we'll wrap it up and uh, and we'll ring the bell and time is up and uh, we'll do another sharing circle sometimes at the end if we have time. And if we have just a few more minutes, we'll play a game. Um, and the games are like, tend to be interactive and fun and they can get the kids a little rowdy. So sometimes uh, we don't always do the game, um, but if we like, okay, we really knocked them out. They're really sleepy. Let's get them amped up again. We'll play like a fun social emotional game. Um, like one example is car and driver. So we'll play like reggae music or something upbeat and fun. And the child in the front will be the car. The child in the back will be the driver and the car's eyes are closed and they're directing them around the room, you know, and it's a trust building game and a team building game. So we integrate a lot of games and movements. Um, we also take the children outside. Um, they are nature deprived. They need vitamin D. They're locked in a building you know, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Sometime during winter, they have recess inside, um, which I believe they should be able to tolerate the cold for the most part, right? Um, at least in New York. Um, and so, you know, we think it's really important. So unless it's teeming rain and they're gonna have to like wring out their clothes, if it's a, a light drizzle or some snow or a little wind, nothing stops us. We take them outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do a mindful walk where they feel their feet on the earth. They're welcome to take their shoes off if the teacher's cool with it. <laughs> uh, we've had them hug trees, you know, we're tree huggers. Um, <clears throat> and then they sit down and they find something loose in nature, whether it's a, a blade of grass or a leaf 
and we sit in a circle and everyone describes kind of like show and tell. This is what we, what we got. And we look at like, you know, how the leaf is so similar to our palm, right? And really give the children a time to integrate and engage in nature. Um, we have we have about 12 different topics. So we talk about the lesson one is about neuroscience. Um, so so essentially there's like a rhythm to the lessons and then there's the topics. So do you want me to get into topics? I want to go through some of the topics. I don't have to go through all 12, but maybe just a couple of them. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, cool. So um, lesson one's about neuroscience. So we teach the children about the amygdala. You know, you have one here and here, and it's the alarm center of the brain. So if you see a, t I set, tell the students, if you see a tiger in the jungle, you know, your amygdala is going to go off and you're going to run and hopefully escape this tiger. Um, but there's no tigers hanging it around, you know, Islip, New York. So there's a paper tiger, right? There's state tests, there's deadlines, there's homework. And sometimes our amygdala goes off because we have to stand up and speak in front of the class, right? And that can be fearful, cause fear. Um, so we can take a, a deep breath and calm the amygdala. And when we do that, it allows our prefrontal cortex, which is right here, which is responsible for higher order cognitive functioning and information processing, and our hippocampus, which is responsible for memory to function better. And so the children, even in kindergarten, they learn the word amygdala, which is so cool, you know? And they say it, amygdala. <laughs> and um, as they get older, we teach them a little bit more neuroscience. We teach them about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. You know, when you're stressed, you're in a um, sympathetic state. When you're not stressed, you're in a parasympathetic state. And that mindfulness is a practice. And that the mm -hmm. more frequently we practice these breaths, the more we're able to self-regulate and calm down and focus and relax. And so even kindergartners want to know, why are we doing this? They're fascinated by the neuroscience piece of it. And the neuroscience piece is an important piece for even a young child to understand. Um, so after lesson one in neuroscience, we teach them um, in lesson two, we teach them about digital detox, which is part of meditation. You know, our phones are very disruptive. We have 75% mm -hmm. of kids, I read in one, one study, are, are up at night with their phones. With yeah, this, this technology did not exist in the last generation. Exactly. It, it didn't. So it's a, it's a perversion of biology. Absolutely. So I'm glad you're doing that. Yeah, it's terrible. And so, you know, my dad had a beeper. I, I was born in 1974. My dad had a beeper. That was like, you know, our computers were black screens with orange font, like, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And now they have a mono, whole. Mono, monochrome. I remember those days well. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we teach them about digital detox and we don't just lecture them. You know, we talk about the fact that they're, the way so technology affects us, you know, and how it affects our sleep, how it affects our levels of empathy towards one another, how only 2% of people can actually multitask, you know, and the average teen checks their phone about 150 times a day. Adults tend to some, be somewhere in the 70 to 80 range, um, unless mm -hmm. you're like an entrepreneur, then you're probably checking it more than a teenager. Um, but, you know, Children report that 45% of teens report that they're on their phone on basically a consistent basis. And they get on average about 239 alerts from their phone a day, which is- really Oh hard. my gosh. Yeah, 239 was the data. Do you know how many alerts I get a day? How many? Zero. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They're there, I never look at them. So it's essentially zero. Yeah, that's great. I love it. Yeah, I, the only thing I have on is when it's not in sleep mode or mindfulness mode, I have mm -hmm. text message come through. I never get email alerts. I don't yeah, engage yeah. in Good. social media on my phone. Good, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So I have to be a role model, right? You have to practice what you preach. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you have to be a hypocrite. Yeah, exactly. So the students, um, do, we do this one activity, which is really impactful, and we get them in groups of three. So... One of them will be texting. The other, the second person's trying to engage them in a dialogue, and the third person is a witness. And and then they we time it for a minute, and they all switch for three minutes, so they all have an opportunity to be in each position. And at the end, we ask them, "How did that feel? How did it feel to be the observer?" And almost in every class, they say, "I can't believe that this is how we live, Mrs. Like I can't believe 
It's so rude, you know, and the texture says they felt rude. They felt disrespectful. The person trying to engage them felt ignored. And we remind them like, well, this is how we're living, you know, and mm -hmm. we're living in a distracted mm -hmm. world. And all the data that shows the importance of being present, making eye contact. And then after that, they do an activity where they walk around the room and they say, I'm here to be seen and I see you. And they make eye contact and they give a little heart and it's about connecting you know, mm. so those are just some examples of what we do in the class. Um, we teach about compassion and empathy and vulnerability. We have the students engage in activities where they share. And this is what the upper grade level, like what's something difficult that's happening in your life, like rose thorn bud, like something that's blooming, that's positive, something that you're going through that's difficult um, and, and something that they're working on. So they do these activities that require vulnerability. So we teach about like Brene Brown's work and being vulnerable and that how, when we're vulnerable, it sparks empathy in another person, you know, it sparks compassion. And so it's really important that the students get to know one another beyond the surface of how they look or how they dress or what part of town they're from, you know, and that practice of empathy and compassion helps reduce racism helps bring a sense of compassion, understanding to one another. So we're really keen on, you know, circle sharing um, to help, you know, help students be more loving and compassionate to one another. Um, and then at the end of the 12 weeks, because I don't want to go through all 12 lessons because it'll be too much, but yeah, sure, at the end of sure. the 12 weeks, they learn how to be altruistic, you know, mm -hmm. and our program is secular. So you won't find, um, even though I like sometimes when I teach yoga, I might use different language, but we, you won't find Sanskrit or anything that's going to be considered somewhat controversial in a school. Um, we scale into public schools, Catholic schools, Christian schools. We've impacted 28 states and 11 um, countries digitally. We haven't traveled to all these countries. Um, <clears throat> so our program has to be acceptable for people of all beliefs, you know, and, and all school systems. So it's really non-controversial. Yeah. Well, that is fantastic. I'm yeah. just so delighted you're committed to spreading that type of education around because it's desperately needed. There's no question about it. Now I alluded to earlier in the introduction that my life has taken quite a dramatic turn since we met in Orlando. Um, I've actually been invited to write a book because of my interest in health that will likely be, and it'll be, be published in the next six months. And it, it focuses on the integration of consciousness and biology. I, I'm pretty well studied in, in biology, at least optimization of biology. But consciousness was always a mystery to me until I encountered uh, a mentor. And so I've been exploring this deeply and I actually had a very deep discussion for a considerable amount of time early this morning prior to our conversation about this topic because it's been fascinating. And personally, I viewed meditation as a powerful discipline, but actually before I'm going to put a halt on my sharing because there was one other question I wanted to ask you because it's going to help me refine my responses somewhat. I'm really curious because you didn't really, I didn't ask for it, but you didn't provide a specific or expanded details of the type of meditation you were teaching in your program? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the type of, so that's a great question. I was going to actually guide you through one of our practices, if that's okay. So you can experience. No, we, we don't want to do that. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> no, for our reasons I'll go into in a moment. Okay. okay. Um, so essentially what we do is we teach, um, mindful breathing. Um, we have the mm -hmm. students sit and we do a variety of different breaths. So one breath is called the ocean breath. So the children will close their eyes. They will sit back, roll their shoulders back and down, sit up nice and straight. And they'll take a deep breath into their belly, feel their belly, lungs, and chest rise and exhale, feel their chest, lungs, and belly fall. And the breath is in and out of the nose. So it's self-regulating, it's calming, it's soothing. Um, and then we'll do this breath for like maybe three or four minutes, five or, you know, we can do up to 12 minutes. The issue is we don't have a lot of time to do like a, mm -hmm. we don't do like a 20 minute seated practice. 
Um, okay, I've experimented with yeah. that. It wasn't super welcomed in the school districts. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes, that, like, TM... makes sense. You have to be pre you have to be pragmatic. Yeah, so it's more pragmatic. Yeah, and so we teach the students like this is a breath that you can use while you're sitting before a test, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. while you're you know when you ask someone on your first date, you know, when you're at a job interview. This is very mm -hmm. tangible, usable breathing practices that you can utilize, but you can also do it in the morning. And we encourage them to do a seated practice every morning for, for four to eight to 12 minutes or 20 if they've been working with us. If we're with them for eight weeks, I mean, there was one school that we had a 36 week program. So we were there the entire school year. So for those students, we can go deeper with them. We can do a longer practice. But if we're only there for four weeks, we're not going to have them do a long practice because even a grown adult can't needs time to build up to a longer practice. Um, the other thing we do is we give them focal points. So we might say, close your eyes, or there's maybe one or two students in a class that have a difficult time closing their eyes so they can put a, an object on their desk, whether it's a, a fake flower or like a little you know, thing like this, like this little turtle. They'll put something on the desk that they can focus on and keep their eyes open. We never force the children to close their eyes because we want to be trauma sensitive to that. Um, Another thing we do, we do a, ver a variety of other breaths, such as um, the five and five breath, which is a normalizing breath. Um, oh, okay, that, that, that's good enough. I don't really need to get into all the specifics. I just wanted a general idea of what you're doing. And, and that was more than sufficient to answer my question. So thank sure you. Sure thing. So let, let me continue with my explanation because I, I've admired and respected meditation considerably and ha had developed a practice that was pretty advanced. I, I would use a, a brainwave entrainment technology called NUCOM and range to the point where because of my sleeping patterns, I, I would be meditating for, t I mean, the lowest point was an hour, but typically go up to two hours. Oh, wow. Uh, on a regular basis. And, But as I mentioned earlier, so that that was my experience. I was a big fan, and this was this was my current practice when I met you, which is why I was so enthralled with diving deep on this. But since I met you, I've been a ticket a, a, a tangent and and learned deeply about this. And I was invited to write this book because of my expertise in biology. And what I've come to learn by writing it, and I didn't realize at the time, this is a, a recent epiphany, really important epiphany. Because I think the intention of your practices, and many of them are spectacular. I applaud what you're doing. And they're absolutely necessary. But I, I strongly believe and I'm absolutely convinced that, that it could do even better with some tweaking. And I'm going to review why I think that is. And hopefully it's something you'll consider. But what I've learned is that when your biology is optimized, and yours is, I sense you're a really healthy woman. And, and this, it, and I use the new comment. That really is the. <laughs> I'm sorry. I use the new comm app. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm not using it anymore. Oh, you're not. Okay. I'm not using. I abandoned it, and I and I I think the new comm app. Is, if you're going to use an app, it's one of the best. But one thing we do. I, I think there's better strategies. Mm -hmm. Does it help? Probably, but you know, why would you do something when there's something that's far more effective? I mean, exponentially more effective, which is why I've stumbled upon. And I thought we were going to talk about new comm, but there's no reason to. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> From my point, so. When you optimize biology, you radically improve your body's ability, your biology to connect to consciousness. That's why you're so good at this, because you're healthy. People who are not healthy lose this ability. And this is one of the reasons you're seeing this devolution in the youth of this country, because their, their health is so seriously jeopardized for, for such a wide variety of reasons. And I, and I really don't have time to go into that now, but their health has declined dramatically. And when that happens, your ability to connect your consciousness is seriously impaired. So that's the first end the item of agenda. Obviously, that's not within the, your scope of what well, you're doing now, but it's just important to understand. About it. Anecdotally, I can, I'm sorry? Anecdotally, I could talk about that in experiencing witnessing children in the group yeah, home that I, I worked getting food from the state. Oh, very, gosh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. It was horrible food. This was 20 years ago. I worked there. I was 28. I'm 49. And I, I tried to do an intervention. It was... Uh, a, a nonprofit uh, organization that I worked at. And I said, we have to change the food for the children. They're, they're, they're overweight. They're obese. They're not healthy. Mm -hmm. We're not requiring them to exercise and they're lethargic. Not to mention that the majority of the kids in the group homes were taking a plethora of, uh, of psychiatric drugs. You know, they were giving sure. these kids. Which only compounds the problem. What's that? Absolutely. 
it only compounds the problem. Yeah, so if you're taking a child that's experienced severe trauma, poverty, and all of these things, and these were children that didn't even have like a strong diagnosis of a, of a severe mental illness. They had maybe some mild depression or, you, you know, uh, adjustment disorders, things that were not really super, that you wouldn't want to highly medicate someone for just an adjustment disorder. Well, there's virtually almost never an indication to give someone a psychiatric medication. Exactly. Because it's just an ignorance of biology that causes them to do that. Right. So, so the point is that they, they were over medicating these children. They were on two or in my one house, they were, they were on two or three psychiatric drugs. And then um, on top of that, they were giving them the worst food on the planet. Like, you know, government mm -hmm. cheese, the lowest, I was, I was researching the grade of, of food that they were giving us. It was basically the low, lowest grade food you could sell in America. And yeah, um, they, because they're, they were profit driven and that's the, the, the overriding variable is improve the finances. Yeah. So I was, I started teaching mindfulness in the group homes and um, I saw really good results, but when you're combating that with poor health, it becomes an sure. issue. And if you want to yeah, talk yeah. about Perfect. psychiatric drugs, I actually lost my sister Beth. And I don't remember if I told you this at the conference. Um, and I'll show you her photograph as well, but I lost my sister Beth 20 years ago in 2003 to a side effect of Paxil. I couldn't agree more. The SSRIs, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Paxil, of which is one, isn't, there is never, 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 never an indication to use that drug or Prozac or any of the SSRIs. They will invariably make you worse. Yes, they may pacify you, they may quiet you, and your symptoms may be more tolerable to those around you, but it absolutely will make your health worse. Yeah. And in yeah. cases like your sister, it can kill you. It absolutely increases the risk of suicide. Yeah, and they're black no box question. warning labels for children. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Altogether, so, so no I one couldn't agree more. Children. Yeah, so I'm, my, my entire I, 50 years I've spent on seeking to understand how to optimize biology. And I've actually, you know, I'm not arrogant about it, but I've become world-class in this. There's not many people on the planet who understand this better than I do. And that's why I was invited to, to write this book. But I never, never understood that optimizing biology improves your consciousness level. And if you don't have that, it won't work. It, it will be seriously impaired, mm -hmm. seriously impaired. So your observation was spot on and, and because you were healthy, your perception was, was accurate. You know, you really perceived reality at, at a very fundamental place. So that's a whole separate topic. Mm -hmm. But once, you, so we're, we're in agreement that you have to optimize biology. And this is a new appreciation that I just learned the last two weeks or so that optimizing biology improves that. And that's what, and I actually gave a presentation on this before I understood it about this topic. And I said that, but I wasn't aware that that was the case, mm -hmm. but now I'm confident of it with a hundred percent certainty. Right. Um, so that's the, the basis of it. But what, I want to share is this, med this my experience with meditation is transformed. So I, so I was meditating. Oh, one of the, let me go into another point. One of the benefits of optimizing your biology, and this I never understood either. If your biology is fully optimized, do you know how much sleep you need a night? Seven hours, Take six again. hours? No, seven would be the answer if you agree with Matt Walker and all the other sleep experts okay. who don't understand optimizing biology. And the studies are really clear, mm -hmm. really clear. You need between seven, eight hours a week. And if you ever think about violating Wait. that rule, you will prematurely sabotage your lifespan. Wait, did you say you need but seven that, to eight hours a week of sleep or? No, asleep, asleep. Oh. I mean, I'm, I'm night, I'm sorry, I meant I'm night. I said <laughs> a week, I meant a, a, a no, 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 seven, eight hours a night. Okay. That, that's the established norm. That's what everyone right. believes. You know, and that's the, and there's literally hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of studies to support that. Right. But what those studies fail to integrate is they don't appreciate what optimizing biology looks like. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting component of this because when you optimize biology, you improve your body's ability to efficiently create more cellular energy. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're sick, if I'm sick, I can't meditate. Like if I'm not feeling well, I'm not going to have a good meditation practice. Well, I'll, I'm going to hopefully convince you that that's not the case. Okay. It's the case from your definition of meditation, but my case is my definition of meditation just exploded this morning. I mean, this is how new this information is. Okay. Which was inspired and catalyzed by our interview because I wanted to explore this topic. Um, so ideally meditation is connecting to that energy and 
there's the way that you know that if you're doing it, because how I, I learned this morning that I'm meditating a lot. Do you know how much of the day, my wake time I'm meditating? Take a guess. It might be two shocked. hours, four hours. No, that's a good Going question. High. No, 78% of the time I'm awake, I'm meditating. Wow, that's impressive. Okay, 78%. You're in a meditative now, state not, or you're actually sitting? That's right. It's a matter of definition. Maybe. It's a meditative state, which is which is the intention of doing the meditative practice that you described earlier and right. is widely acknowledged as the way to do this. But th those are disciplines that take us away from the true meditative state. And I was shocked. Mm. And I think you'll be able to confirm this because of your exposure to all these children that you're teaching. And you even alluded to it earlier in your conversation that the ultimate, it almost brings me to tears. <laughs> the ultimate meditation is when you're playing. Yeah. When you're playing. Mm. And kids do that all the time. Right. You don't have to teach a three-year-old how to meditate mm. because they're meditating close to 100% of the time if they're healthy. Right. So that's why these younger kids, you know, in kindergarten, you, and, and you, 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 I was impressed with your uh, efforts to get them out of the meditation state that you, kind of, you, you, you taught them for, you know, this deep relaxation and play. And then you were teaching them a play exercise, which is exactly the ultimate meditation. Because the purpose of meditation is to get into this timelessness moment where you, right. you're, you're not connected to time, where your mind is not focused on everything. It just time becomes, it's absent. Right. It's not there. You're in this timeless state. And that's what kids do almost all the time until they're screwed up by our culture and our perversion of the food they're getting and the electronic assault on their minds. Right. It's all decreasing their ability to improve, cell, increase cellular energy and connect to the, the energy they're sourced from. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. We actually, you know, I was in a kindergarten class. I was in uh, about 10 kindergarten classes last week with um, half, the, half the students had autism and other disabilities that are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in regular ed classes. And basically we did play almost the whole time. We did the butterfly breath, which were- Perfect. Yeah, we're moving around the room. And, and my, guess is, yeah. my guess is you in real time figured that was the right choice. Yeah, well, I had a list of animal breaths. So I had, and there's so much- But you chose not to use those. No, I, I used them. I used the animal breaths. Oh, okay. but yeah, I did. I did switch up the animals a little bit. Yeah. I, I winged the animals. So I had like, I, I didn't have a dinosaur breath. If there was a kid there that loves dinosaurs. So instead of doing the lion, we became the dinosaurs. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you do a lot of mm -hmm. freestyling when you're there. Um, but we did the butterfly breath. We did the dinosaur breath. Um, we became fish. We, we did all sorts of movements. And then the kid. But you were playing. You were yeah, encouraging we're play. Yeah, we're playing. I mean, yeah. then we're, we have them go around. We do shake it out, you know. We actually were in a, uh, a lot. I was in a lockdown drill last week. And I don't know if you've heard about lockdown drills. They're terrifying. They just say. No, I never, never even know such an animal existed. I'm not surprised, yeah. but I never they knew They say that. lockdown, lockdown on the loudspeaker and all the kids. Oh my gosh. It's like, it's kind of like the uh, nuclear fallout drills that we did when I was in grade school, you yes. know, get under your desk because they're throwing a nuclear bomb at you. And that's like, that's going to yep. save you, you know? I was in those too. And they should have collected data because I could tell them today that I was completely traumatized from those fallout drills. I said to my teacher, mm -hmm. by the way, if there's a bomb going off and it, it blows out the windows, we're all going to die. Whether I was in second grade, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah our desk were in the yeah. hall, and she was like, "That's enough out of you, Miss Winter." But, um, yeah, yeah, because you knew the truth. Yeah, she did. I was, I was not afraid to say the truth, even in second grade. Yeah, yeah, so, that's that's why you're good at what you do. <laughs> yeah. So uh, last week, I have to tell you, it was traumatizing. I'm in the school. I said to the teacher, "Is this a real lockdown or is this a drill?" And she said, "They don't <laughs> tell us." They don't, they don't tell the teachers if it's real or if it's fake. So the teacher's di completely dysregulated. We're not sure if no, there's it's... a school shooter in the building or whatever. Um, so I'm with these students for 10 minutes, huddled in a tiny little corner. It was about five by five feet, but their little bodies are so small because they're five years old. So we're all huddled together, knee to knee, shoulder to shoulder. I, 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 I was holding back tears because... Not that I was afraid for my own life, which I guess part of mm -hmm. me probably was, mm -hmm. but the terror that they experienced during that 
during that lockdown drill was horrific. So I had just only been in the class for two minutes. I just introduced myself and then it went lockdown, lockdown. So then we're sitting and waiting and I said to her, no one's going to tell you if it's real. <laughs> um, and then we heard click, click on the door and she goes, oh, that's just the principal checking, you know, the door. But I'm mm -hmm. thinking, well, is it the principal or is it a school shooter? Because I still don't uh -huh. know. Mm -hmm. No one's sure. validated this. So the drill. Oh, basically... excuse me for interrupting. But now it, I never realize what the purpose of the lockdown was. I, I just immediately thought it was related to COVID. But no, you're referring to school shooters. It just occurred yes, to me. Yes, school shooters. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, I didn't realize well, sure, that. Which we do have back. to do prevention and we do, you know, so it was just terrifying. Mm -hmm. So now the kids are completely dysregulated. And mm -hmm. I said, we're not going to get out of this corner. We're going to sit here and we're going to do some breathing. I showed them some breaths. We came back over and I said, forget breathing. We're going to play. We're gonna play. Yeah. <laughs> you did it. I did it. Yeah. I turned on Bob Marley. I turned on Bob Marley and we did shake it out, which is like somatic work. We did our right arm, like the hokey pokey and our left arm and our other arm. And then I said, and then we did the lion, which is. That was the perfect thing to do. <laughs> yeah, that was perfect. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah, we, so we did yelling. We did, and I didn't care if anyone was heard lions yelling. I love a lion breath. We did yelling, we did shake it out. <laughs> we ran around, we became sharks. We were shark hunting. You know, we did all of these animal movements. And, um, and then we got in circles and we shared how we felt. And then I did some breathing. And then one girl said, I still feel anxious. So we did some more movement breaths, like Qigong style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Moving the energy. We shook it out again. We shook it out again. And then finally, I mean, it was the most movement-based class I'd ever taught, which we, in every single class, we do movement and games usually. But, <laughs> but the point is, yeah, I, all I did for 40 minutes was recover them <laughs> from the lockdown drill, you know, and um so they definitely need play and they need to go outside. They need to play. They need to have yeah, fun. Good, yeah, hundred percent. You, 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 you nailed that's why many of the things you're doing existing are just what they absolutely need. There's no question about it. I have no recommendation other to continue that, but the concern is establishing a breathing or meditation practice. And, and there is no question that meditation does provide some physiological benefits. And I've concluded that the editor had done this for a long time and actually done some measurements that one of the primary benefits physiologically is that it increases your CO2 levels. And interestingly, when you optimize your biology, you create more C carbon dioxide if you're, if you're doing it correctly, and which radically improves your biology and ability to connect to energy. So, but the thing is you don't necessarily need meditation to do that. There's other ways to do the C increase the CO2 level. Right. And, and the breathing and these rigid, rule based, not necessarily rule based, but <laughs> disciplines to get to, to free the mind is so unnecessary in kids. It's just like the exact thing that they don't need. They just to need to do and be encouraged to do what you just did with them, yeah. you know, to facilitate their ability to, to go timeless and to play. Yeah. That's the solution. Right. And, and if they could do that more, improve their health and biology and do the play, they could be meditating 50, 70% of the day. Correct. Yeah. And it's integrative mindfulness. So in week four, we teach mindful actions and mindful mm -hmm. actions is all about integrative mindfulness. And we talk about that mindfulness isn't just, we, we talk about this in week one as well, you know, about mm -hmm. integrative mindfulness, but we get deeper into it in week four. And we say that mindfulness isn't, is 24 seven. That's the quote that it, in our curriculum, it's 24 seven. It's how you treat other people. It's how you speak. It's how you eat. It's how you move through the hallway. It's embodiment. Mm -hmm. So it's all about embodiment. Mm -hmm. I, I did a one-on-one -on -one last week with someone at a school, a teacher, and um, I talked to her about that. It's like, you know, just, it's the same thing as me being a psychotherapist. Like when I used to see people for 45 minutes a week, that's not going to change their entire week. You know, like I'm not that amazing. It's going to help them a little bit, right? It's going to help them reset their consciousness, rethink their thoughts, reframe, whatever, the cognitive behavioral techniques. However, you know, um, you need it to be integrative and it's how you move through the day. Are you running mm -hmm. through the hallway? Are you tense? So her assignment is to wash dishes mindfully and to do laundry mindfully because she, she didn't like dishes and laundry. So I don't really like them either, you know? And so when we have an aversion to something, we, when we're doing anything that's unpleasant that we don't like, it causes stress. You know, joy happens from doing things we love. So children are not going to be stressed when they're playing because playing is fun. They're going to be stressed mm -hmm. when they're sitting in a class, locked in a chair that's sometimes glued to their desk, you know, where they can't 
they can't move and they're stuck. So of course they need the meditation for those moments when they feel trapped or. Well, meditation in, in need the, breathing. That, the breathing or, you know, just a, a change, in, a shift in consciousness per, or perception to do that. Yeah. A shift in consciousness. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So there's, they need the mindfulness practice, like the breathing, because they don't have autonomy over what they're going to do with their day, unless they're at like a Montessori school or a more progressive school mm -hmm. where they have the ability to go do what they like and what they enjoy. But in a regular traditional school setting, they're sitting and they're listening to a lot of lecture, you know, and so many of these teachers are wonderful teachers, but it's just the school system in of itself isn't designed for fun. And so it's really important that they learn to do the breath while they're sitting there, maybe not so satisfied, and then also to play. And so um, we actually last year rewrote our curriculum for the younger students to integrate more, more games. We sp I spent days with staff at my house, yeah. actually. My team came together and we worked on rewriting some of the content to make it more fun. And it's like us, like you're never stressed when you're, when you're out with your friends or you're at the best concert oh, in your no, life. Absolutely. You know? So absolutely. So there, I think it's important to bring a distinction or redefinition of play because most of us think of play. We think of kids playing around, which is what you're describing. And that's great, but we can do it as adults. Every one of us need to do that. And the reason it's so valuable is one of the, the, the primary reason we were put on this planet is to create, mm -hmm. but not just to create, to create with joy, which you just referenced, to integrate both of those. And when you're doing that, you're all playing. Yeah. You are playing. And you can heighten your sense of consciousness. Like I also, you know, I've trained lawyers and graduate students and all sorts of people mm -hmm. in this, these practices. And I say to them, there's an ROI. Like some of my mm -hmm. mindfulness practices have been the most, uh, have given me ideas that have dropped into my mm -hmm. consciousness because those ideas were just waiting to be birthed. They're out there in the ethos, you know, you have to just tune in consciousness right, to access those ideas. So I've had ideas about, you know, having an event and the event, mm -hmm. like I had an idea once, throw this, throw your friend a birthday party. And I was like, in my meditation, I said, how is that going to help mission B? So I threw my birthday party and out of that event, I met somebody who gave me a huge donation and someone else who gave me a big one. <laughs> I ended up, I added up the math from that that idea that dropped into my consciousness. And I raised like 170,000, which is like, was half our budget or is half about half our budget. Cause we, we were mm -hmm. not like a huge charity. And so I, these lawyers said to me once, well, what's the ROI? If I give to your charity, I said, there is no ROI. Your ROI is good karma. I don't know what to tell you, it's, you know, but you get these creative ideas and it increases your productivity, you know, when you're conscious, cause you're tuning into something greater than yourself. You know, whatever. And there, you there's another way you can do that, though, too, uh, that enhance that and be synergistic with that strategy. And you're doing it already because clearly one of the most powerful strategies is to trust yourself. Yeah. To trust yourself. And when you do this on a regular basis, you will get these downloads, which you got yeah. for clearly. And it clearly, did. and you can do it in meditation. Or you can do it more directly and, and pretty much continuously throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can tune in at sure, every moment. It. Like every moment's really an opportunity right. to tune into higher consciousness. And then you could be find yourself, like Eckhart Tolle talks about, like walking around in this blissful conscious state where you're tuning yeah, in. For design. Yeah, you're tuning in, you're receiving messages of higher consciousness and you're tuned into whatever. Everybody has their own definition of what that is, whether it's God or a higher power, you know, um, but we're all tuning into that. And then when you are in that zone, you're going to get closer to your highest healing purpose on this planet because yes. I believe in like angels and God. And I think that they're speaking to me through my meditation and they're helping yeah, direct I, I my think, path. I think that's accurate. I think you're accurate. hundred percent. Yeah. You know, I had the kids once in fourth grade, I had just started mission B. I was working in an elementary school and it was the district I was, I was still employed by them. And we did a meditation and we talked about Mr. Miyagi from karate kid. Cause they were reading the book karate kid. Mm -hmm. And I talked about Mr. Miyagi and how he's embodied and he's a small dude, but he can like chop through concrete and the power of his mind mm -hmm. connected with the strength of his body. And, and what a mentor he was for, uh, I forget the credit his name, but it's called Ralph Macchio. <laughs> you know, what a mentor he was. And, um, then we did it from that discussion. We did a meditation. I said, just, I want you to envision someone there with you in your meditation that you love and admire and that you look up to. And I was playing Enya and all the children had their eyes closed. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. I felt this sense of divine grace in the room. And I looked around, and four of the 20 kids had tears rolling down their face. Not like sobbing, just like an adult would have, just rolling down their face. And I looked at the teacher, and she had tears. 
And I'm just mm -hmm. saying, close your eyes. Imagine you're on a beautiful beach. You're there with someone you love and care about, a mentor, teacher, someone you trust. And imagine that they're sending you unconditional love. Mm -hmm. So when we opened our eyes, the students, this little girl raised her hand. She said, Miss Winter, I felt my uncle that died. And this other girl goes, mm -hmm. I felt my grandpa. And then this boy goes, I saw God's face. <laughs> I was like, I'm in trouble. Wow. Like, oh, wow. How old were these children? Fourth grade. So oh, like yeah, nine or yeah. 10. See, that, that's when the transition starts to occur. Yeah. Earlier, I mean, they get out of this natural, spontaneous ability to meditate spontaneously. Mm -hmm. They start to lose it because of the culture and, and how we're perverting their biology. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was fascinating. I was so moved by that moment. I said, this is, mm -hmm. this supersedes psychology. Like they're tuning into a higher force. They're tuning into mm -hmm. God and the angels. And it was just, it was so beautiful. And I didn't initiate that. Yeah. It just happened. And I felt that grace come through. And so that's mm -hmm. the type of consciousness we're opening up, up to. And I think that children yeah, have an yeah. innate ability to be intuitive. They have very powerful gut instincts. You know, their prefrontal cortex is still developing till they're 25, but their gut instinct is probably stronger than ours. And um, yeah, they could be our teachers. They really could be if we let absolutely. them. Absolutely. If we allow them and if we allow them to, to that, if we validated their intuition, you know, and talk mm -hmm. about using your gut instinct and using your intuition, using your wisdom. And, uh, well, intuition is just another way of trusting yourself. Exactly. But That's you're right. That is, that is the goal. Right. That really is one of the greatest spiritual lessons that you could have is trusting yourself. Yeah. And, and, and being confident. And, you know, they surveyed middle schoolers and the one thing they all want socially and emotionally is confidence, which, ne which yeah. comes down to trusting yourself. Right. It's a, co it's a cousin of, of self, of trusting yourself. You're yeah. right. It's an absolute cousin. They're really similar, really similar. Yeah. So I think that, you know, and then we, we've collected tons of data on these students. Um, we had, uh, a young woman at Stanford University doing her graduate senior thesis on our program. And we saw radical changes and improvement in mood. There was like 20 something kids in her small little cohort study. And I think it was 26 and um, all but like two or four, I think it was four kids were, were unhappy or in a negative emotional state, frustrated, angry, upset. And by the end of the 12 week program, it was, it, it was the opposite. It switched. Two felt okay, um, and and one was unhappy. But the other students, the other twenty three students, were were in a positive emotional state. So it's like if you don't learn social and emotional learning, you know, you're not going to be, you're not going to know it. Like if you don't learn math, you don't know English. You're not going to how to do five plus mm -hmm. five because you no one ever taught you five plus five. And right, so right. social and emotional learning has to be an integrated part of the curriculum if we want to improve you know, well-being and consciousness and social and emotional health and mental health, really. It has to be taught to the student. Well, it, mental health is a, just an absolute artifact of doing those things. Correct. Yeah. You're, if you're, you're tuned you're, up, you're, you're going to feel healthy. <laughs> yeah. It's just spontaneous. You don't have to do anything special. It just happens. Yeah. Yeah. So I think our children just in general need more joy. And also children have so many mirroring neurons. They have like around twice as many mirror neuron, mirroring neurons that I have, right? And that you have. And so they learn from our behavior. So if a teacher is dysregulated, you know, they're going to pick up on that and they're going to uh -huh. be dysregulated. The parents are fearful. Yeah. Um, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of people were in fear and anxiety and our children felt that, you know? And so that's uh -huh. why it's so important. Sure. I tell parents when I teach a parent workshop, I said, the most important thing you can do is to regulate your own stress. Forget about teaching mindfulness to your kids. Spend a year just learning it yourself, you know? Send them to us, we'll yeah. teach them until, <laughs> until you, you're, you've got it, you know? Because a dysregulated parent is gonna mean a dysregulated child because they, they're picking up on their parents and, and their emotional state and their well being. So I really, um, the same thing with teachers, we talk about self care and personal practice and that, that's a really important component of teaching mindfulness to children. It's the, it's the number one thing you can do to teach mindfulness to children is just to learn it yourself. And, Cause they're going to yeah, you. It's, shadow it's, you. it's essential. It's a, it's an absolute requirement. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, you know, we train teachers in this stuff. We have a couple models. One model is we go into schools and we teach, um, in schools once a week for anywhere from like four mm -hmm. to 30 weeks. Um, the second model is we do online training for teachers. You know, anyone who's watching this, I can give them a 50% off coupon to that. It's only like 
225 or something for a, a six week course. Um, mm -hmm. And we teach them all 12 lessons and we give them videos and they get short practices alongside of that. Um, so, and then the other thing is we do, we just opened an office, our first office, and we've been in, in business 10 years, uh, right in Islip, New York. And we do one-on-ones with families, parents, teachers, anyone that needs it, any member of the community, you know? So I think that those are our three models. And then we have online recordings that folks can access for free of how to teach simple meditation practices. Um, yeah, so we're primarily in Silicon Valley, like San Mateo, Santa Clara County, but we've gone to Wyoming, we've gone to Florida, we've gone to Connecticut, we've gone to Jersey, you know, we've gone all, you know, Austin, Texas, we've gone all over the U.S. Um, so anyone who wants us to come help them, we're like, we're there, you know, uh, you and we're a nonprofit. So we accept donations and, um, and we welcome them. You know, it, the pandemic was really hard on schools that were serving, uh, on uh, nonprofits that were serving schools, our budget went from like 550 to 350. And right now it's around 250. You know, it's like, we're still recovering, you know, um, sure, from the sure. pandemic. Um, we got a small amount from the PPP, the first one. Um, but anyway, the point is that, you know, there's only 160 or 180 days of school and only 120 that we can serve because the first 30 days and the last 30 days, the schools are too busy for us, you know? Mm -hmm. So we sure. can't make our full budget in 120 days. So we, um, we need donors and supporters. We're actually looking for advisory members and volunteers right now and ambassadors. So if anyone's listening to this and they want to volunteer for an awesome charity, um, you know, we're in 36 schools. I'm the only full-time person. So our, our overhead's low. We have like an administrative assistant and a director of programs. They're both part-time. And then the rest are our educators, you know? So. Okay. So how does someone find out more details about that? Yeah. So it's missionbe.org. Um, just go to missionbe.org. There's a donate page. Um, it's missionbe.org forward slash make dash a dash donation. Um, but if it's well, volunteer, I'm sure there's a link to it on the home. There's a link to it on the homepage too. Oh right? yeah, there's a link on the homepage, and they could just and my emails on the homepage and my phone numbers on the homepage. Like basically, I'm very very reachable. People can email me, phone phone me, text me, whatever. Um, yeah, so we're looking for volunteers. We're looking for donors. We really definitely need support for sure because we've gotten a little hammered, but we're recovering, you know, and we're we're staying positive. But the work we do is really beautiful. Like it's also aligned with um, like if there's any administrators listening, like all of the standards, New York State has some of the most strict standards for education. Onerous. Yeah. So it's aligned with uh, SEL, anti-bullying legislation, mental health legislation. And it's all done in a way that's non-controversial. Like I said, we're welcomed into Catholic schools, into Christian schools, into public schools. And um, and so administrators love that because the amount of mandates that they have from the state is just completely unrealistic. I don't know how any classroom teacher could fulfill all these mandates and teach, you know, five different subjects. Um, so that's really cool, too. But, yeah, I think the most important thing is just keeping kids conscious, getting them to be happy sure. in a way that's natural and obvious, like play. Let them play. You know, what fourth grade yeah, boy is meant absolutely. to be stuck in a chair for six hours a day? No, they weren't. They, that was not part of the design for sure. I can't even sit still at a conference. I'm in the hallway the whole time socializing. <laughs> no matter how yeah, good the conference is, I'm always up socializing, you know? And uh, I think that the kids really need that. But yeah, th I, I, I want right. to thank Beth from Documenting Hope for bringing us together. That was a great conference, by the way. Yeah. So I want to applaud your efforts for so many things, for optimizing your biology first. It allowed you to radically improve your spiritual journey for sure and uh, ultimately lead to a relatively refined ability to trust yourself mm -hmm. and have the self-confidence to and awareness to make a lot of these good choices you're doing and uh, really applaud you also your efforts to share this information with a larger audience so oh, great work you. thank you dr mercola it's my pleasure you are again are one of my all-time heroes and uh i was looking you up on youtube this morning and um bunch of stuff mm -hmm. came up, but under every single comment, it said hero here. I put, I put Dr. Mercola is a hero. And then I scroll down through the comments and everybody said, you're a hero. <laughs> like There was one that was just so beautiful. You're loved by so many people. It's an honor. And I'm so grateful for your time and for you, this interview and giving me the time to share about my nonprofit mission. Well, well it's important. It's an important topic. And as, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's a, a massive fascination that I'm currently 
investing large amounts of my awake time into. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know that I would dialogue about like this when I initially invited you. I thought we were going to really have a quite different discussion, but you know, things change. That's one thing you can count about with me is things change yeah. as I learn new information. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for your consideration of you the so insights I shared with you and um, take it from there. Thank you so much for Keep your wisdom. Work. I'm so grateful. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye. Thanks so much for watching. Remember, hit the like and subscribe button so you can get more videos that can help you and your family take control of your health.